Hello, welcome. Um, I'm very honored to announce you our next speaker, Captain Crunch, John Draper. Please a warm applause. Thank you. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the really methodology that I use to find the secret numbers inside the phone company. Or what I say, unlocking the secrets of Ma Bell. Ma Bell back in the uh, early days was a monopoly. Um, because it was a monopoly, that meant that uh, they controlled your phone. When you pick up the phone, you get a dial tone. The phone belongs to them. The dial tone belongs to them. Anything you do on the phone line belongs to them. It wasn't until early 80s, until the breakup of Ma Bell, that allowed you to be able to uh, connect DC Hayes modems up and stuff like that. Well, Ma Bell kind of screwed up. Um, she actually published a little-known journal uh, at Stanford University called the BSTJ, the Bell Systems Technical Journal. And uh, with a special sensitive hearing by blind kids, the secrecy was unveiled by an article in the 1971 October issue of Esquire magazine and uh, called The Secrets of the Little Blue Box. And that opened up the Pandora completely. Now, when you made a long distance call back in the day, you could hear some really faint crosstalk audio from these signals and they leak out. They're very soft and only a blind person could actually listen to these tones and recognize what they really are. This is because all of the all of the signaling is done in band, which what is meant by that is it's in the same audio band you talk on. And these are audio signals. And uh, the hang-up signal is 2600. Now 2600, of course, is the same pitch uh, when you blow into the Captain Crunch whistle. That 2600 hertz tone is what is used to basically hang up and pick up but you're not hanging up and picking up your phone, you're hanging up and picking up a trunk line. Now there are two levels of access to Ma Bell back then. There was tandem or trunk level access, which is mostly used by the internal operators, uh, test boards and things like that. Then there's a subscriber level access, and as a subscriber of the phone, that's you and me and everybody else. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, stacking tandems and I have a recording that I want to uh, show you and I want you to hear this uh, do I have any uh, audio coming out over there from my computer because I'm ready to start this right now oh okay I guess I'm not gonna have the audio because they didn't connect up the audio into my into my laptop so let's go on, shall we? And we'll do that part later. Right now, let's go back to the presentation. So if my audio man will save me here by giving me an audio connection, we'll hear that later on. Basically, what I wanted to play was a recording of tandem stacking and uh, what it sounds like to make a blue box call. Now, I was the one that... Uh, that uh, pioneered guard banding. Guard banding meant that when you send a 2600 down the line, you could only get one trunk to the next uh, receiver point. In order to uh, send the 2600 to the second receiver point without dropping back to the first point, you've got to send another tone along with... Whoa, I just lost my audio. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good. All right. Sounds like I got some audio now. Let's go back over to this uh, this recording and get this going right away. Okay, what we're what you're listening for here is just dialing an old pulse dial phone. Okay, a regular long distance number. The narrator is a uh, doorbell. The number that's ringing at this point doesn't matter. What's important is that this call has gone over a trunk from New York to a distant foray 
which can be reset by 2600. Can y'all hear it okay? There's That's the supervision handshake, off hook, on hook. And now it's waiting for new digits, which then will supply. Those are the blue box tones. What he dialed was 216-054-064. These are old routing codes. The network of the 1970s had routing codes for tandems in all major cities. The first code, 216054, is the routing code for Youngstown, Ohio. The 064 in the area code of 216 is the routing code for Canton. I'm getting other sound through here. Both of these are crossbar tandems. What is it? When Ben keys in this sequence, the 4A into which he is keying picks up a trunk to Youngstown, Ohio and sends 064. That tick is the 4A cutting through to Youngstown, Ohio after having sent 064. Sorry about the audio problem. What does do with the 064? Well, it picks up a trunk to Canton. That's the code for Canton. But having been sent only the routing code and no digits can follow it, it simply dumps us into the Canton trunk without sending anything. In other words, it stacks. Yeah, let's just ditch That's the audio. The this, is not, Ohio. this is not going to work. Am I still on here? All right. I just had to unplug it because I was getting all kinds of crosstalk there. Sorry about that. So as I was saying about guard banding, uh, this is a way of being able to basically push forward from trunk to trunk to trunk to trunk. Now, the best you could do is about eight trunks. Uh, with S with uh, crossbar tandems and the b ability of being able to do that, you can probably reach about 30 trunks by looping back and forth between two cities 30, 30 or so times. And uh, I would have liked to play the tape, but uh, the audio was just too poor for this. So the phone company basically had to redesign their whole network in order for this thing to be, uh, be uh, viable and to protect from doing this. The thing about blue boxes is they worked anywhere, and I mean anywhere. I went to this place at Grasshopper Junction, Arizona. It's a crank phone. It's this big box like this. You turn the crank like that, and you hold it up to your ear like this. You speak in this little thing like this. Like they call this a potato masher. And you're like that, and I stuck my blue box next to the thing like that and hit the tones, and it worked from a crank phone. So it works from just about anywhere. You could do a whole lot of things with it. You can monitor phone calls. You have complete operator access. Uh, and you get all these different uh, uh, operator codes, like inward operator and uh, other operators in other distant cities and everything like that. So being able to understand the recordings that you get when you, when you either misdial a number or call a number and it's not recognizable. There are two different kinds of recordings. One is a tandem recording. These are the recordings that come on dur during the time when you're making a long distance call. So these recordings relate to a long distance call. And they usually will work with something like this. We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. This is a recording, 2132. I'll explain the numbers later on, but that's a tandem recording. Dis disconnected number recordings are a little bit different. It comes on and I'll say, we're sorry, the number you dialed is not a working number, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it turns out that 800 number assignments are in groups of tens. This means that if I wanted to scan an 800 prefix, I don't have to dial all 10,000 numbers. I only have to dial just 1,000 numbers to get all of the different numbers in Washington, like in Washington, D.C. The 800 number for Washington, D.C. is 800-424. That will map out to 212. 456 or some other exchange and though that's called six digit translation by taking advantage of that six digits means by groups of tens so now my scanning has just become ten times more efficient patterns start showing up I started uh, understanding where the assignment numbers are so I didn't have to do the whole 10,000 numbers I really only had to do about 2,000 numbers uh, this then caused us to be able to uh, find every single 800 number in, this, in the Washington, D.C. area. 
And that brings me to another very interesting discovery. 80424. 80424 being Washington, D.C., it turned out that uh, by the time I got down to 9330, I got a recording that said, We're sorry, the number you called has been disconnected. That meant that 9330 through 9339 has got valid numbers in there. That meant that I had to go through that through and skip by one instead of skip by ten. And it turns out that 800-424-9337 got a very rude person answering at the other end. I asked them, what number did you dial? And the person said, this is a special number. You're not supposed to call this number. Get off the line immediately. Well, that raised all kinds of flags in my head. And I said, wow, this must be a really interesting number. I'm not supposed to call it. Therefore, it must be interesting. So I wrote it down in my little red book. And several weeks later, I, I go to a little phone freak gathering and I was shown this really cool number. And uh, us phone freaks like to trade numbers. So I saw this beautiful conference number and I wanted it. And, what he, and the guy said, what do you got to trade? I'll trade you the... 800-424-9337 number. By the way, I found out later on that that number was a CIA crisis hotline to the White House. It's a number that you dial in if you are a CIA agent and have to talk to the president right away. At least alert the president that you need to call. Once he's been alerted, then you can go over to a more secure phone and carry on the conversations as securely. Well, it turns out that the code name for Olympus was Nixon. So Nixon equal Olympus. So we said, Olympus, please. One moment, sir. A few minutes later, Nixon came on the line. And my friend grabbed the phone from me and said, Sir, we have a national crisis on our hands. Sir, we're out of toilet paper. And we hung up. <laughs> so we were probably the first people that actually pranked the White House. And this was sometime between 74 and 75. And shortly after that, Nixon got impeached. And we lost Nixon. But that was sort of like one of the pranks that, that we pulled. A few pranks that I didn't pull, but another person pulled, was in Santa Barbara. It's possible to send 2,600 down the line in Santa Barbara and make the line show up as, on, as off hook, or I'm an mean on hook. That meant that once you grabbed that trunk, other people could call into that trunk as long as you kept the 2,600 on. And so you were actually intercepting calls going into Santa Barbara. So what we did was, we were telling callers that Santa Barbara had a nuclear accident. And, that, and then all of a sudden, other, other people started to call, the press, the military, and all that stuff. And so we said, well, we better hang up the phone. So we got, so after pandemonium started for a while, everybody started to hang up the phone and everything was just disappeared. I wound up in the LA Times the next day. Pranksters, pranksters had somehow managed to intercept phone calls in Santa Barbara. So, Back to the tandem recordings uh, earlier, uh, I talked about uh, the three-digit, no, uh, four-digit number that you saw. Well, if it's 2137 as it is here, the 213 is the area code where the tandem is located at. The 2 is the size of the trunk that you're dealing with. The lower the number, the greater the size of the service area. A number two is equal to a 4A switch, and if it's number one, it's a regional switching area serving a very wide area, perhaps the entire West Coast or something like that. So those are what are called tandem recordings. The local recordings are here, and this is what happens when you call an unassigned number. And by being able to recognize this number and the being able to recognize this recording is very important in scanning operations. Because when the phone company assigns numbers, they assign numbers in banks of 10. So if you, don't, if you get a number like this, you know that there, the entire 10 numbers following it are not valid, so don't even bother looking for them. So what I did was, I designed and developed the telephone interface board when I was working at Apple Computer. Steve Jobs, at the time, thought it would be a really cool idea to have a telephone interface board. By the telephone interface board, what it meant that I could do anything on the telephone. I could pick up the phone, I can get a dial tone, I could sense the dial tone, and I could sense the difference between a dial tone and a ringing and a dial tone and a busy. I could also sense audio recordings or audio voice on the line. I used a programmable phase lock loop 
with a uh, resistor ladder array that allowed me to be able to digitally control what frequencies I wanted that digital phase lock loop to detect. And uh, it had two phase lock loops and it had two audio channels. I had another one where I had a, a 256 uh, byte sine wave table and I was skipping through the sine wave table loading a, a digital to analog converter and the analog output would be just a sine wave. And then by how fast I was skipping the table determined what the frequency was. And I had a frequency table built in for both multi-frequencies, the blue boxes, and of course touch tones. So my technique that I was using uh, to scan numbers has really turned up some amazing information. Uh, watts extenders, uh, internal test numbers, computer access numbers, the whole kit. And I built a huge, huge database of unpublished 800 numbers, internal company numbers, loop around numbers, 1,000 watt milliwatt tests, uh, um, uh, demonstrator numbers, that when you call that number you get a dial tone and then you can dial off of that dial tone and call anywhere you want to call. Washington DC, of course, is my favorite area of scanning. I spent a lot of time scanning there. I dug up a lot of stuff. Federal telephone system accesses, Audubon military accesses, the White House CIA crisis hotline, which I just explained earlier, the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA PBX scanning numbers. By getting into the PBX, I was able to find other so-called unknown PBX numbers by making a deduction that 6,500 through 6,900 were the numbers for, let's say, the FBI or whatever they were. These aren't really the numbers, I'm just giving them as an example. So there's nothing that's immune from this technique. So this actually will work today. You could actually go to an unknown phone system, look at the phone directory, look at the exchanges in the phone directory, and know that you don't want to try those numbers. You want to try numbers that are really special numbers. I think here in Europe, if you dial zero before the number, that that's interpreted as a long distance call. In the USA, it's one. Okay, so right away, you want to start with number zero, and you want to try to experiment around to see what's going on. When I was in the Soviet Union back in 1988-89, I had a lot of scanning there. And I found out that I could actually dial into the KGB's uh, internal phone network. And I was able to find certain codes, and by flashing the hook switch, can get passed into their trunk system. And from there, I was able to get actually access to outside lines and make calls to the U.S. complements of the KGB and make it free. Of course, I didn't spend a lot of time doing that because it's probably pretty risky doing that kind of thing. But uh, it was certainly possible to do that. There's also a way of, of protecting it. So if you have a computer that's online with a dial-up and you want to protect your computer system, you'd better deploy some type of a random code generator. It's this little device you carry in your pocket and it's got numbers on it. So when you're ready to log into the number, you read these numbers and you type it in. That code then will change in five minutes or three minutes or however long, and then that way it's just one extra level of security. But this type of scanning can be done today. What can be done today? Well, there's this number called Project MF. Get out your pencils, folks. This number is important. I'll give you time enough to copy that down. 630-485-2995. Uh, and this is called the Blue Box Project. It's a phone number that you could call, and you could use this number to test your blue box. You could send 2600 down the line, and it'll go kerchik, or whatever it does, and then you could use blue box calls. Key pulse, number, and start, and it'll let you make a call. And it's just set up as a demonstration purpose is to test a blue box to see if your blue box will actually work. Uh, war dialing software is out there. That's very popular these days, war dialing. But war dialing really attacks a lot of attention. So if you want the authorities to really know all about you, you can start war dialing. Social engineering probably is a little bit better, uh, but they still are viable in digging up for information. Ask Kevin Mitnick when he talks about ghosts in the wires. So Kevin Mitnick knows all about social engineering. He's probably one of the best there is out there. Uh, specific local hacks. Mechanical switches are still in use. So when you're on a mechanical switch, you dial a number. Just by listening to what happens will tell you whether or not that number is good. When you dial like a, a five and the dial goes back and you hear a little clunk, that's probably not going to be a valid digit to use. So you probably will discard that right away. But if you were to dial a seven 
and comes back. And you don't hear that clunk? That's probably going to be something that the switch is going to want to see more of. So then you send more digits to it. And then you dial a digit until you hear that clunk. When you hear that clunk, then that number is not a valid number. So step exchanges are really easy. You can really probe into, the, into getting exchanges pretty quickly that way. It drops you into some really interesting stuff. By flashing the hook switch down up, and you hear a little clunk plop, whoa, boy, you just dropped yourself into a trunk. And from there, you can do anything. Well, in-band signaling uh, does probably still exist. It's very rare. Uh, I believe that uh, small countries in, in Central America are using it still, uh, but uh, I'm not really sure. But the last USA in-band signaling got disconnected and decommissioned in 2004. I was actually called by the media to actually demonstrate a blue box call in the last blue boxable tandem. I respectfully declined uh, because of the fact that blue boxes are still illegal and the laws haven't caught up to the technology yet. I already talked about the Nixon prank. Uh, a couple of other things that I did was uh, connecting two operators together can result to some very, very humorous conversations. I'd call one information operator up and then I'd call the other information operator up. One would say information, the other would say information. But I'm information. No, you're not. I'm information. And so they sit there and they talk, and sometimes they'll, they'll tell each other, well, what position are you? I'm in position 195. What position are you? Oh, I'm in position 21. So how do we get connected together? And they're sitting there just scratching their heads about that one. Uh, one time, too, when I had access to the Audubon, and I was stationed at Charleston Air Force Station in Maine, they had a PA system. And uh, when you dial uh, a PA number of 205 into the local, just the local exchange, uh, you know, they have a local, uh, like, uh, PBX number on the base, and you dial 205. The two, any numbers that begin with a 2 is called a Class A number. Any number that begins with a 3 is just a normal number. But a Class A number, you dial 9 to get an outside line, dial 8 to get an auto on. Well, you can also have in-dial. So when you're in Alaska somewhere and you want to call a direct extension into, into Charleston Air Force Station, you dial the Charleston Air Force Station prefix, like 456, whatever, and then 1, and then 209, or 20, whatever it is, and that'll ring into the actual PBX number directly without going through an operator. So what I did was, I just got into the Audubon, dialed 209, and then I, and then I, t and now I'm talking to the PA system of the entire Air Force Base. So whenever I talk on the phone, the entire Air Force Base hears me over these big loudspeakers. And I told the commander to suck it. Um, the Audubon, of course, is, uh, is, has got a lot of very interesting stuff. Uh, but uh, I, I knew what the numbers were, but I didn't have the balls to try it. It's too risky, and I don't go there. It's just really, really cool that you can do all that stuff. But the way it was done is through, ta is through a tandem stacking through Nicholson Creek, Alaska, and Murphy Dome, Alaska. So when you call a Murphy Dome number, you're actually using the same trunk that the Audubon uses. All they're doing is they're just class marking it to a different trunk. And by class marking it to a different trunk means that you can't, oh, you're not authorized to call an Audubon number from the commercial number. And so to get around the class marking, you have to know you have to come from another number that's part of the Audubon network. So I did TANO stacking. I do, I do KP 907 940 950 1231. Bingo. I got up into uh, NORAD. I waited for NORAD to hang up the phone. It go ka chink ka chink plop ka chink and now I'm sitting on the Audubon and now I'm completely can do anything I want to. I can use priority one, priority two, flash, flash override, do anything I want to from my home phone just with the blue box. And I'm and I'm probably at a higher privilege than any of the other Air Force bases around there because I'm actually on the trunk level, not on a subscriber level. And they they're not gonna check on whether or not I have authorization to use priority or not, but it actually will work. But again, it's pretty risky. Another thing that I did a long time ago was uh, back in, uh, I think it was like uh, 1998, 1999, I had my good old webcrunchers.com server, which at the time was using an IEMS Macintosh OS 7, uh, where I had a mail server that does outgoing mail. It was an open relay. Well, back then, open relays didn't really didn't really hurt you, except spammers found out what it was, and I started getting a whole lot of spam going through my open relay. 
That was when I completely converted webcrutchers.com over to an open BSD box. And uh, then I modified SendMail because even though I went over to open BSD box, they were still dictionary attacking me. So what I did was I modified SendMail so that when you go into the, when you, when you go into the uh, RCPT uh, and the HEL, whatever it is, and, and you go through the, uh, go through the mail protocol, uh, when, when you put in the number of my address, if it doesn't exist on the server, it just holds the connection open forever. So it makes it impossible to like do a dictionary scan. And so, but if you're actually a legitimate user, you just have to call up maybe about a minute or two later and try it again. Another thing that I did was I put a, I put a, a, a five digit number after crunch. So crunch 34672 at webcrunchers.com. Then what I did was I had all these different offers on the internet. And so what I did was I went to these offers on the internet, which of course were spam. I went ahead and put in this address in there. So now when I get spam, I look for messages going to crunch34672 and I know that that, per that particular person was the person that I've already got their website. I already know who they are. And these are the people that hired the spammers to spam on their behalf. So then I contacted them and told them, hey, you don't want to do that because these spammers are illegal. And so I turned, and so I I actually talked them into not using this, this mail, bulk mail service, which was doing illegal spamming. The number 34672 is totally ignored when you're using normal mail. So when I were to send mail out and put that number in there, then you could just simply reply back and it would go to me. But I know that that 34672 belonged to somebody that I sent mail to. So when I, I send a mail to, let's say, Joe Schmuck somewhere, and I give him that, I give him that a special number, then I can tell when he gives that email out to anybody else besides him. So I say, don't give it out. Here's my private email. And then all of a sudden I see an email with his code number on it, come back as an incoming message, totally unrelated to him. Then I know that he gave it that number. So it's like a little reality check sort of. Well, anyway, what I did was I was able to uh, go through an automatic collection of spam. Now, webcrunchers.com just kept getting attacked and attacked and attacked. I was averaging somewhere close to 300,000 spams a day over about 70 different accounts on webcrunchers.com. I collected everything. I ran these uh, inbox files through a uh, process that looked at all the mail headers and did a, did a who is on all of the different IP addresses that it found. With the who is, I extracted out the abuse email addresses and uh, then I would send uh, a complaint to the thing and built up a big database of every single one of those uh, spam messages. And I identified all the different ISPs and then I found out where all the proxies were and then I shut them all down. And this, was, this took place in, uh, in 2004. And then when I went to Malaysia at Hack in the Box in 2004, I stopped, I turned off spam crunchers at that point and all of a sudden, when I got back home, it was just back up to where it was. Because I think I caught about 15% of spam throughout the entire internet just by doing this very, very aggressive, very, very active way. And if there's a bogus who is address, no problem. I just go to the upstream provider through the looking glass uh, by using the ARP network, and I could find out where the upstream provider is. And then I attack them and tell them, hey, one of your, one of your downstream users is really hitting us hard with spam. And I can really kind of nail these guys big time. I also wrote my own mail handler in Twisted Python. Twisted Python is an amazing tool. You can write any kind of server client application really quickly. So I wrote myself a little mailer using Twisted Python, which had a lot of really cool things added to it. It also kept a large database of spam looking for patterns and identified hundreds of bogus hacked IP addresses. Uh, these are IP addresses that are just assigned not through... Uh, APNIC or through Aaron or through uh, RIPE. Uh, I think RIPE is here in Europe. I'm not sure. But uh, whichever ones they were, these are the people that assigned IP addresses for large ISPs. And uh, there are ways of hacking into the routers, upstream routers, to, to make your own IP block. And a lot of these IP blocks are all unauthorized. And uh, so I've identified wh where they were. And I passed it on to, uh, I passed it on to, uh, to APNIC and all these other people. 
And then I did my aggregated spam, spam reports to ISPs. So ISPs could subscribe to aggregated spam reports, like Comcrap, I mean Comcast. So Comcast will have you, uh, have you, uh, have me every day. I would send them a spam report of maybe five or six hundred IP addresses that have, that, that, that have been known to spam, which are their users. So they can go through and they can tell their users that they've got spam or they're participating in a botnet of sorts. And this huge, huge IP blocks of spam sources that I built up, the, the longer it, it was built up, the faster I'm able to identify where they were. So if this one was already in the database, I would, I would calculate that. But I would also merge, if there were two IP blocks that are merged that are together like this, I would merge them together and make a different IP block. Like, for instance, uh, uh, a slash uh, 24 is a, uh, is a class C. So uh, then I would make it a 24, I would make it a 23, and because I'd merge the two together. So, and then that would mean that uh, as more and more data starts building up, my database entry is becoming less and less, which was really cool. What am I doing now? Well, I'm obviously doing a lot of speaking gigs. I'm promoting my book, uh, the upcoming talk I've got it, uh, in Malaysia in October, Hack in the Box. Uh, I'll be there. I'll be telling my story, uh, not unlike here. And by the way, I sold my story for book and movie deal. And uh, I'm currently working on the book and working on a screenplay. I live in L.A. right now. And I'm also... Uh, doing crunch creations. Uh, you might take those uh, URLs down below there. So if you are really want to become uh, part of the crunch creations team of really hotshot programmers, this is where you can really shine. Uh, we encourage people that are already working. Uh, we're not asking for anybody to work or anything like that. We're just making them available. If they are, if they do have work and want to have work, when work becomes available, we're building a really nice venue for collaborative work using video conferencing, uh, collaborative uh, text editing, and all that through Crunch Creations. Uh, that, of course, will be called members.crunchcreations.org. And the members.crunchcreations.org will have a login and password. And in order to be a member, the vetting process is going to require you to spend anywhere between 40 to 60 hours of your time, non-pay, to become part of this. And just to give you an idea of how how, how much intensive screening I do. Uh, you have to be on Skype. You have to let me look over your shoulder while you're coding, which means that I get to see what you do over screen share. So I can say, well, gee, how does this guy code? Well, what does he do? How often does he go back and look at things? Uh, how, what's his memory like? How, do, where, how does he use the resources available to him to make, to make the code, to make the code work? Uh, then they have to do a 15-minute video presentation, not unlike what I'm doing here right now. Uh, but just talking to a camera at home, whatever, and uh, with a presentation of what they're interested in. So if they got a really cool idea, they could present that in a 15-minute in a video. Then they have to write a uh, document. They have to write a 15. They have to write a nice manual and document. Two levels: one, a document for the developer who is maintaining the program, and the other one is a document for the user or the person that uses the program. And that's kind of what we're doing with Crunch Creations. CrunchCreations.org is the actual company's website. That's the website that our, our clients are going to want to look at. And then there's CrunchCreations.com. That's our blog. And anybody that wants to become part of the Crunch Creations team should go to CrunchCreations.com. And when you go to the CrunchCreations.com, at that point, you will be able to, uh, you will be able to uh, uh, sign up and register. And only those people that register through CrunchCreations.com blog will be considered uh, for applicants or a membership into the Crunch Creations teams. Uh, Crunch Creations team has got a lot of really good technology. We want Drupal people. We want uh, Ruby on Rails. We want Python, Django, PHP, MySQL. We want iOS, iOS 3, 4, and 5, and 6. We want Android 4. We want all these different application developers. And we're really focusing right now on the portable market. So we're building up a good team for doing these kinds of development work. And because we've got such high quality people, uh, we don't really have to outsource to India. So most of the people that we're looking for are going to be either in the US or Europe or wherever we can get them. Uh, that uh, wants to do it, even India. So far, I've had 20 Indian programmers apply. None of them have qualified. So this is sort of how very strict it's going to be to do that. So how am I doing on time? 
and core. Yes, if you want to finish and allow yeah, some we're questions. Done, yeah, we're almost done. So anyway, so take down that crunchcreations.org, crunchcreations.com. I think you're going to really like to do that. What else am I doing? I'm working out. I'm healing myself. Um, I've had some couple of surgeries behind my back, and I uh, wasn't really permitted to travel until this, just this year. So it kind of sucked to get all invited to all these talks and not be able to travel. But now I am okay. I'm social networking, and I'm JD Crunchman. Remember that JD Crunchman on all the social engines. That includes Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, AIM, uh, LinkedIn, Skype, Gmail. All JD Crunchman. I'm. JD Crunchman everywhere. So that's just how easy it is to reach me. Now, questions. Who has any questions at this point? Yes. When you started working for Apple, how did your view on the corporate world change? Like before, it was probably, um, I want to hack it, I want to get it for free, maybe. How did it change your perception? Well, back when I worked at Apple, there was no internet. Okay, there was only the telephone. Uh, that was even before modems became publicly usable and accessible. It wasn't until like 80, 81 that modems came out. And I was working at Apple back in 77. There was only the cassette, the Panasonic cassette player, which uh, I used to uh, load in my programs. I developed the software for the phone board while I was working at Apple, they had a little annex building off from the side. They had one big main building with a small little room called the production room. That's where they were making the Apple Ones and Apple Twos. And then I was in a little annex building about four or five doors down in a small little strip mall in Sunnyvale, right next to Bob's Big Boy. And I can remember we used to cut a hole in the fence between the, the Apple and the Bob's Big Boy. Steve would go down there and print on his little 40-column printer, little, little notes saying, for your convenience, and clip a clip a little plastic bag of Alka-Seltzer tablets on there for the Bob's Big Boy. But uh, that was kind of like the mindset. Uh, everybody was really just really eagerly just trying to get, to get things done. You know, I, at the time, Randy Wigginton was just in high school, and he's still at Apple today. And uh, I've interviewed him extensively for my book, by the way. So uh, all that's pretty much in the bag as far as that goes. Any other questions? Speak up or forever? Yeah, where? Down here somewhere? No other ones? Ah, right there. Um, hi. Uh, you seem to use a lot of Ad Apple products extensively. Do you think Apple is uh, superior to other, like, uh, more free operating systems? Or what's your opinion on this? My opinion is that, uh, is that Apple is, is better than all these other operating systems. And it's based on, well, uh, other than OS 7, which is really closed, my opinion of Apple was that they were very, not very compatible with the rest of the world. It wasn't until they came out with OS X, uh, built around FreeBSD, that I really, really started to respect Apple for what, really what it was worth. It's now on, it's now on a Unix operating system or Unix-like operating system. And so uh, it's, uh, it, you have a little bit more control. There's a lot more software for the Linux and Unix environment now that's available on the Apple. Um, so, uh, all in all, I, I really respect it, especially when it when it went over to Intel. And now I get best of both worlds. If I want Windows, I can put it on my Mac. So, what the heck? I want to have a Mac instead, instead of having a hack and a, a Hackintosh. A Hackintosh is Apple operating system on another computer besides Apple. They call it a Hackintosh. So, that's, that's why I like Apple better. I mean, it's just, it, I, I, I've been familiar with it all along. I haven't really liked Windows that much, and the only time I had to deal with Windows was MS-DOS when I was doing Easy Writer for that IBM PC. And that in itself was an amazing experience, but uh, you'll get a chance to read about that in my upcoming book, I'm sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, have you had um, any nasty conversations after your hacking attempts? And how come you haven't wound up uh, working for some military? That's a very good question. Uh, uh, you know, once I got busted, I had to be interviewed by the FBI because that was part of my, uh, my so-called quote-unquote cooperation. And so uh, my attorney uh, set up a meeting between me and the FBI and all of the other agencies involved 
because the FBI wanted to know how I happened to come across the NCIC crime manual that they found in my apartment when they kind of searched it. And that really freaked them out. I also had another, uh, another incident where I had a, a phone number or a, 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 a ham call letter, WB6FBI. And uh, they were freaked out because they thought that person was an FBI, uh, a person working for FBI and leaking information out and stuff. So the authorities took a really, really hard-handed approach on me. They wanted to throw away and lock up the key because I told the FBI, I said, look, why don't you just have me work for the phone company? I could probably have the thing secured in about a month. But they did not take me up on the offer, even though I did offer to work for anything. Why, well, even the, uh, uh, let's see, in Stanford, uh, uh, one of the, you know, one of the uh, SRI, Stanford Research Institute people, would often take me down and treat me to dinner and pick my brain. But that's about as much as they did, really. Uh, that's about it. Any other questions we have here? Speak up now or forever hold your peace. Thank you. So now um, I'd like to ask you. Too much close to uh, the speaker. I would like to ask you if uh, there are any technical difference between freaking on analog lines and ISDN lines, and uh, uh, private lines uh, across uh, ADSL. Uh, now what's contracts. ADS? Um, DSL lines. Oh, DSL. Okay. Yes, DSL. That uh, where analog uh, speeching are uh, cross the core over uh, 22 kilohertz, but the, the, I think that there is not a trunk on the company side. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, you were asking me what the difference is between what? Okay. How is possible to have a phone freak across the DSL lines that you then have the possibility to listen? The, the trunk signal upon it. Well, you'd have to have pretty specialized equipment to do that. Number one, when you start tapping on a DSL line, you're changing the audio characteristics of that DSL line. And when you do that, those DSL lines that they use for a high-speed data transfer is very critical. And uh, those lines all have to be pr provisioned by uh, putting all kinds of filters on the line to make sure that the data can go through the line without too much interference. So anytime you put anything on that line at all, even this, even like a, a, a 50 picofarad capacitor across that line to pick off the information off that line, you're going to upset the integrity of the line. So I don't think it's possible to just tap in on the line and see what the data is. You, there's, there's probably a better way to do it by, by sniffing the network using a packet sniffer. Uh, that, I, that would be my approach, you know. Unless, of course, they're using uh, switched routers and stuff like that. It would be a little hard to do. Um, any other questions? Speak up now. We can do one more last question. So who's the lucky guy? Yes. Yeah, so uh, what about the security of the phone system today? Is there anything left uh, open or...? Well, um, phone systems still are, are becoming more and more computerized. And uh, in the USA, they have what are called DMS switches, which are digital switches now. And uh, they, are controlled by, they are controlled by a, a terminal inside the switch room. And uh, they do have access. You could go in there in the switch room and get access to any, 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 any uh, switch room at all by just simply knowing what the phone number is. However, you probably won't be able to get much out of it because, again, they're using a rotating key card. Most of them are these days. A rotating key card is a little thing you wear in your pocket, and it's a random number generates every, every minute or two. And when you're ready to log in, the login will ask you for that random rotating key code, and you type in that key code, and then if it matches, then that's okay. A minute later, that code changes. So your ability to actually get in on that line is going to be pretty hard. Uh, unless you actually work for the phone company and have access to the switch where you can actually go into the terminal and do stuff with it, it's pretty hard right now. Um, and the cellular network right now, there are people out there that are actually building their own cell towers. Let me just quickly elaborate on one thing. When I was at DEF CON, they have this very elite group called the, called the Ninja, the, uh, the Ninja Party. And the, the ticket for the Ninja Party this year was a cell phone. 
they give you a cell phone. But the cell phone's got a SIM chip in it that only knows how to connect to their own little cell phone tower right there at the, at the uh, Rio Hotel in Las Vegas. And they park it in a van next to, the, next to the conference center there, their own little Wi-Fi tower. And then, and then when you get your phone, you got to go through a series of sequences to assign you a phone number to that phone. And then you get a directory of all the other people in the ninja party. And you can call these other people up using your little cell phone. And it's, they're, using, uh, they're using the open source uh, asterisks and the, uh, and the electronics required to, uh, to make and create your own cell tower. And you just simply apply to the FCC for 5 or $10 for an experimental cell phone tower, and you got yourself legal, you could put up a cell phone tower. And the people at TourCon this year in Washington had a cell phone tower for their own telephone. A lot of phone-free gatherings now are doing that. They're actually making their own cell phone tower. So they're getting into the cell phone system. One more thing I want to say about cell phone networks is, like on the iPhone, there's uh, API calls, which are very secret between AT&T and Apple and any other provider, that has a standard set of API calls that you could call to control not only your phone as a cell phone, but you can make queries to the cell phone tower and get access to all the people that are on that cell phone tower, including their locations. And this is scary stuff. I thought about writing an app, app like that, but I do not want to see that app see the, li see the light of day. That's too big brother for me. I would never want to write one like that. But, I mean, to be able to have a phone like this and move it around like that and say, ah, oh, Joe Schmuck's over there talking on the phone. He's 600 feet away, you know, in that direction. So that's pretty scary. So... Uh, because of that, I looked at the API calls and said, oh my God, I didn't realize you could do so much with that iPhone, but you can. And I have to say, uh, uh, it's out there. You just have to find it. And I'm not going to tell anybody how. <laughs> Any other questions? I want to thank you, John, everyone. Thank you very much. Give him a warm applause. My contact information. Feel free to take notes. These are my numbers, my phone, everything like that. I got an international line via Google Voice. Comes in quite handy when I want to call home. It's free. Legal free calls now. I don't need no more blue boxes. I've retired my blue boxes. Thank you very much, very much, people.